disciples. We're calling it the dynamics of a disciple. <clears throat> we're in our first section we're looking at. We're looking at the fact that disciples are followers. A brief, brief, brief uh, review. Um, we mentioned last week that a disciple is someone who is more than a Christian. It's not just, you know, I'm saved, I'm automatically a disciple. That's not how it works. Okay, a disciple is a Christian that really takes another step. In their life, they, it's more than just the fact that they have salvation. Salvation has them. Jesus, they don't just have Jesus, Jesus has them. We looked at the little, uh, we looked at the little thing here. Based on what Jesus said about being disciple, here's a little definition. It's one who puts into practice and does what Jesus says and is willing to make the sacrifices it takes to be what he wants. Very, it's, it's, it's sad. Very few Christians actually get to that point. Very few actually are to the point where they're like, I want to know what he wants me to do. Um, I want to be obedient, and I'm willing to sacrifice to get to where he wants me to be. So the first truth we are seeing is the fact about being a disciple is that disciples are followers. As I mentioned before, because you trust Christ as Savior does not automatically uh, make you uh, a Christ follower, a phrase which, I'll just be real honest with you, I do not like. Now, I'm not, I don't, I'm not against people being Christ followers or following Christ, but I, 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 I'm a little, uh, I had coffee before church, it wasn't that good. Uh, I'm a little putrefied at, at people that use that phrase, and they have no clue what it means to follow Christ. Yeah. Uh, now, if you want to be a Christ follower and you're following Christ, I'm 100% for you. I just don't like the way we've kind of marketed that phrase and kind of hijacked it without actually doing it, all right? It's like the little, you know, the little thing. What would Jesus do is worn by people that would never G do what Jesus says. And so that's free. Take that. Um, if we are a disciple, though, we are a disciple because we have chosen to be one, okay? We trust Christ as Savior. He does everything. But when it comes to being a disciple, we've got to do something. Yep. Okay? We're the ones that have to make the step. We're the ones that have to follow the instructions. We're the ones that have to be willing, as we saw last week, to be different. We said last week, number one, disciples are followers on a different path. And I'm not going to go over that again. If you missed it, it's probably online somewhere. Uh, listen to it. All right, this is new. Number two, disciples are followers... And I like this, without hesitation. Matthew chapter 4, verse 20 and 22. Jesus told the story we read before was Matthew chapter 18 and 9, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, where he tells them to follow him. Then the next verse, and they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed them. What are these verses talking about? These are the verses that are, 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 are after the verses we read before. Peter and Andrew, who were just called, and they were willing to be different. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. But they immediately, the Bible, the word straightway, they left immediately and followed Christ. There was no excuses given. There was no questions asked. There was no, you know, final task to finish. They just followed. They didn't say, I have to finish this first and then I'll follow. Uh, I have to do this or what does this involve? What does this entail? They just said, Jesus said, go, we're out of here. Okay? I like that. Then Jesus comes upon James and his brother John. Fishermen. Now, these guys are fishing with their father, a family business per se, perhaps. And Jesus called them, and they, met, they immediately leave and follow the same way Peter and Andrew did. They left their businesses. These men additionally left their family, the dad, to follow Jesus and do his work. It's funny. There's two things that will usually keep people from following Jesus. The first is their business. And I don't mean a business like owning a business, but really, you could just lump this into the desire to have money. You know, work comes first. Uh, being prosperous comes first. And by the way, I'm not against work. And I, I see what the offerings are each week. I'm not against prosperity. But I'm against those things 
if you will put them in front of following Jesus Christ. If you could get a situation where you'll make way more money, but it's going to hinder you following Jesus Christ, don't make way more money. Until after the building's done, okay? And then you can uh, come back. I'm just, but but, but we, people do that all the time. So businesses, finances. But you know what? Both of these men were fishermen. They kind of had their own business. But you know what? They were, they were fully on board. They're like, I'll leave this in a heartbeat because Jesus called me. Some, by the way, some, I won't get off on a tangent here, but we'll just spend a second here. Some, you don't have, you're not in a business and you haven't made money, but that's why you won't follow Jesus because that's the desire of your heart. It's kind of sad that more people would, if we had an invitation to say, you know, who's going to follow Christ and serve him full time with their life? And I know it's not for everybody, okay? But if I said, if we said that, there'd be some that God touched our hearts that would come. But boy, if we said, who would come down the aisle, altar, and allow God to make them the next Russell Anderson, these altars would be full. And we need some Russell Andersons. Okay. God hasn't called you. Be honest, work hard, make money, and give to the ministry. Yeah. But listen, don't put that off to the side. Don't put Jesus, serving Jesus off to the side to do that if that's not what God wants you to do. And these guys just dropped it. The second thing usually that people, uh, that people will uh, use is their family. Now, that must have been hard. Think about that. You know, working with your father. I mean, if you have a good family and you, you, you grew up and, and you get to do a family business with your family, now most people are like, I'd kill them. Okay, I get that. But, but that, that's probably a dream of their life. They're out there with their dad working a business. And Jesus says, hey, come. By the way, I don't see anywhere in the scripture where the father hindered them. See? How often do family hinder us? And I, and I know this. I'm, it's not pick on young people night. I'll be done with this and I'll move on to the whole thing. But sometimes you kids use your family as an excuse not to serve God. Yeah. Look, I'll just be honest with you right now. I, I, I up and left and went to Indiana to go to Bible college one year after I started going to church. I mean, I was so green as a Christian. It was ridiculous. But my pastor said go. So I'm like, okay, I'm going. If I would have went home, because my mom, you know, she's a nervous type. If I would have went home and said, you know, Mom, I, I'm kind of thinking about going to this Bible college Brother Black asked me to go to, but I, I don't really know about that, you know. But what do you think? She would have probably said, oh, no, stay here. I went home and said, Mom, I am excited. I'm going off to Bible college. It's going to be great. And she's like, oh, okay, that sounds good. We try to manipulate things, Okay. So, so don't man manipulate your parents into getting you, especially if God's touching you. If God, I'll say this, and, and it's, I don't know what happened to the notes. If God's touched you to do something, I'm just going to say this nicely as a pastor. You will not be happy doing anything else. If, he, if you know God has called, now I'm not talking about you called yourself. I'm not talking about your mommy called you. I'm talking about you know that God's been working on your heart about that. If you don't do it, you won't be happy ever doing anything else. See, the thing you think will make you happy will not make you happy. Yeah. I'm just telling you. And so find out what God wants. And don't hesitate. That's the really, the, the, the thing I want, that's the point here. Let's get back to, the, they use the word straightway and immediately. They both mean to go directly at once. Can you imagine that? Jesus, hey, you, you drop that. Okay, let's go. Follow me. Make, I got a new job for you. You're not going to fish. You're not going to fish for fish anymore. You're going to reach people. And they're like, I mean, they didn't, they didn't stop and say, you know, I'm going to sell my nets. Let me go ahead and sell my business first. Let me get things in order. They were like, hey, you guys handle, I'm out of here. Okay. And so uh, if we follow Jesus Christ, now let's put it on a very practical level for all of us. If we follow Jesus Christ, that means whatever he wants us to do, we should immediately and without hesitation obey him. See, most people hesitate. We hesitate in two ways. We hesitate by procrastination. You know, I'll do it later, right? Everybody's going to serve God later. Young people especially, like, you know, I got my whole life ahead of me. Let me just do my thing for a couple years, and then I'll, then I'll be a serious Christian. That won't work. 
You know, well, uh, God talks to you about something. I need to deal with that issue in my life. You know what? I'll deal with that issue later. Uh, there was a statistic pastor used to always give that if, if you hear something, if you don't put it into practice, I think it's either 36 or 48 hours. If you don't put it into practice, it doesn't happen. Okay? You, what are the, what's the, the, the world philosophy when you're learning a language? Use it or lose it. We're all going to read our Bible later. You know, we started at the beginning of the year. We encouraged everybody to, to read our Bibles, and you jumped in, and, and maybe you were, you know, yeah, I was going to do it. Don't wait. We're all going to learn how to witness to someone later. Okay? Understand this. There might be somebody that can't wait till later. There are people out there that God ha- that, that will come into your life, that will come into your path, that you can actually win to Christ. But if you don't learn how to do that, those people may never be won. You know, one of the exciting things is we haven't been to Wilmington. I think we ran a bus route there. I don't think we've ever taken our, our church soul winning over there. It's been exciting. Those are people that never would have got saved if we wouldn't go over there. Yeah. And, and it's exciting. We are all going to live for God later. We're all going to be generous. I'm going to give later. I know we're in the building now. I know we have missionaries now. And, 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 and you know, once I get everything in order, let me explain something to you. We're never going to get everything completely in order. Okay? Now, we work on it. Let's be organized. I get that. But, but don't let that, let's not let that stop us. Let's not procrastinate. If it's something God tells us to do, let's just say, you know what, Lord? I'm in. Let's do it. And then also, we, we hesitate in the path. We don't want to get on that direction. We don't want to follow right there. We'd rather live our own life. Now, I, so, uh, uh, let me just do this slowly. Okay? And again, you know, if you're growing as a Christian, you're not going to be a saint. You're not going to be, you know, you're not going to be uh, the next missionary to Cambodia overnight. All right? It, you grow. But some people, they grow really slow. I mean, really slow. People that got saved at the same time as them are far outdistancing them in their spiritual life. What's the issue? Procrastination. And by the way, that's human flesh. We all have to fight that, don't we? That's the two things. I'll obey right now. I'll do what he says, and I'll get on that path. Now, let me make a couple thoughts. We'll go to the next point. They were willing to leave all and follow him immediately. Now, why? Because they were convinced that he was the Messiah. Now, think about that. That's why they followed him. This wasn't some nobody. This wasn't some crazy, wild-eyed guy that you can, you can look on the internet now. There's guys all over this world. They, they're nutcases. They're usually immoral, and they say they're the Messiah or some ridiculous thing, and they have a following of 30 or 40 people that will follow them all over the earth. That's just nuts. That wasn't Jesus. They, look, Peter and Andrew had already met him earlier, and I'm sure the other guys had heard about him. And so when they saw him and he said, follow me, they were convinced that he was the Messiah. And because they were convinced that he was the Messiah, they had no problem following him in their life. Once they were convinced, they were willing to commit. That's important. Now, let me make this statement. If you and I were convinced enough to trust Jesus as our Savior, then why shouldn't we be committed enough to follow what he says? I, I just, I don't understand this. We have enough faith to trust what he says about getting to heaven, but not enough faith to trust what he says about living on earth. Which is more important? Let's just be real here for a minute. Because eternity is a really long time. And, and I don't like this, but God didn't ask me what he, I liked and what I don't like. I don't like hell. It, it, it bothers me just to read about it. To think that someone would actually end up in hell. You think of people, and, and over the last few years, there's been famous people that have committed suicide, whatever. It's like, they thought, if they probably weren't saved, they thought that they were getting out of misery by doing that, and it only just began. Yeah. 
But yet we'll trust Jesus Christ for the most important thing ever, to save our souls, and we'll put our trust 100% in Him for our eternal destination and eternal security. And yet if He asks us to, to, to meet together in church, to read His Word, to have a close relationship with Him, to try to live right, we can't do that. He asks us to simply live for Him, not be perfect. There's no one in this church that's perfect. You say, well, I thought brother so-and-so was perfect. You are misguided. And if you come see me, I'll tell you exactly why he's not perfect. We're not. But, but to try to live right? Why, why can we not have that faith? It's because of all the stuff that's going on around us. But if we would just get in the habit of obeying immediately. We hear something. We read something. We know it's scripture. We know it's truth. We just simply say, I'm in. I'm in. So disciples. Number three, disciples are followers, even if it means earthly lost. Earthly loss. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9, we meet an interesting individual, one of Jesus' disciples. And as Jesus passed forth from hence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. Now, if you want to know what the receipt of custom is, think of this. Three letters that scare adults to death. I-R-S. Okay, irrational, uh, reckless, that's, that's the W. <laughs> I-R-S. That's what Matthew was. And by the way, the tax collectors of those days were worse. And he said unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Matthew was a tax collector. Now, there was two types of tax collectors. One, there was a regular tax collector. He would just go and pick up the taxes. Then there was the custom house tax collector. He was the guy in charge. He was the guy that had an area. He could collect anything he wanted and as much as he wanted. He was responsible to turn a certain portion in. So therefore, they were very, 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 uh, greedy is not the word. Uh, they were liars. I mean, they just, they, they were rich. They can invoke as much taxes as they wanted. Where was Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom? He was the top end guy. He's not the IRS guy that just works in the office. He's the guy that comes at you. Okay. By the way, if some of the politicians in our society have their way, they're going to make tax collectors in the Bible look like nice guys. Um, be careful how you vote, by the way. Matthew was the bad. That position gave him great power, though. You wouldn't want the tax collector to be on your bad, you wouldn't want to be on his bad side. Okay? It was lucrative. Great power and great wealth. Now, we, we know uh, from secular history that probably the tax collectors, if they were Jewish, were excluded from the temple. They were not liked very much. But I don't know how, but somehow he had heard of Jesus. He had to have heard of Jesus. And when Jesus came and said, follow me, he up, left all that money, left that power, left that position, and off he went, and he followed Jesus Christ. As I mentioned before, we struggle with this all the time. The reason, and like I mentioned before, we hesitate and we'll put a job or finances ahead of the Lord is because we really are living for what's going on on this earth and we're not living for, what, for what's going on in the other. Yeah. And by the way, the next, the next thing kind of balances this whole thing out. We will put it. We want to commit to it to Christ without contributing with our resources. We want to come in. We want to just appease our conscience sometime. We want to be included just enough to make ourselves feel good when push comes to shove we are not willing to suffer any loss for sake of Christ and his commission our life is built around what we have and if we're not careful and we live like that we squeeze Jesus in whenever we can but it's not really a big thing to us our schedules are, are built around what we want so we can squeeze Jesus out when we find an opening. I mean, there's some people, listen, they, they, they'll put, they, they, you know, I, I know how it is. Football season comes, you lose a few guys because their team's playing. I hope their team loses. Yeah. Unless they're a Rams fan, then I hope God gets to them another way and leaves the Rams alone. Because I, I stay in church when the Rams are playing. Yeah. 
but, they, they, you know, or, 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 you know, their buddy asks them to go do something, or they can go do this, or go to grandma, whatever it is. And it's like, well, you know, I'll squeeze them out this time. There are two reasons why we should be willing to put commitment over Christ over any earthly loss that it may cost us. The first, of course, would be a great love for the Lord Jesus Christ. That just ought to be, that really ought to just be the motivation for everything we do. You know, if, if we have to, if, if, you know, if you only serve God and you do things because you constantly hear it behind the pulpit and you feel pressured to do it, and, and, and that's part of preaching, but, but if that's the only reason you do it, you need to get the motive correct. Really, preaching like that is just supposed to remind us of what we're supposed to be doing if we love Jesus. But, but we have to get that love for Jesus down. We say we love Jesus more than anything else, but I'll just be real honest with you. Do we? And I, that's rhetorical. I'm not saying that to condemn you. It's just let's think about that. Do we really? And I know in my life, and I'm sure in your life, all of us would say we don't love Jesus enough. I understand that. But as we look at our lives and what we're willing to do and willing to really follow him the way he tells us to, do we really love him enough to say, I'll do it even if it costs me a little bit? That's what we should be doing. Second, a, the second is a love for others that Jesus wants us to have in our lives. Now, if you follow through this chapter, afterwards, there is a party held where a bunch of sinners come and Jesus is there, primarily to try to reach them. You know who threw the party? In one of the other Gospels, it tells us it's Matthew. Imagine that. Matthew gets called out of it. He's willing to give up all of his, uh, his job, his money, his prestige, and he, he brings all these people in. He wants them to meet Jesus. Yep. Now that's when you know someone's got it. Amen. You know, you can always tell when a new convert got it right away. They bring people with them all the time. All the time. I mean, they're like Matthew. It, was, it probably wasn't hard for Matthew to get a bunch of sinners there because that, were, that's the, that was his group. That's the people he was hanging with. And someone gets saved and they, they fall in love with Jesus. What they want to do is they want, they want their friends to, to, to learn to, to follow Jesus. Now, after I got saved, I mentioned a few weeks ago, I knew my friends were bad for me, and I just ditched them. They were coming around looking for me like, where, you know, we don't have cell phones or any of that. You know, they're like, where have you been? What's going on? Like, I, you know. Had a girl call one time with the host, and she called me and, hey, my parents are home, why don't you come and hang out? And I hadn't seen her in two months. She goes, and I'm, I'm, I didn't answer her because, you know, that's not the right thing to do. And then she's just like, well, man, what have you been doing? And I was kind of embarrassed. I like, well, look, just, let me just, said, I got saved. <laughs> she's like, huh? Like, I go to church now all the time. I read my Bible. She had to go real fast. But I started going back on my friends because I did care about them. And I'm like, once I felt, I'm like, you need to come to church. And I'd invite them over to dinner. And my mom, would, we would have dinner before church. And, and I, we'd eat there. And I, and I, you know, I didn't know any better. I had chick tracks. I'd put chick tracks all around their plate, okay, like a setup. Like you can't get to the mashed potatoes unless you go through, you know, this is your life, okay. And, and I'm like, read that. We go to church. And then. Maybe this is the wrong way to do evangelism, but, you know, the pastor would get done, he'd preach. And after time he got done, I'd say, hey, come with me for the invitation. They had no clue what we were doing, John. I'm like, okay. And I came down to the front, and I'd say, Brother Sisson, I was still a new Christian. I, I didn't know you, you, you called him Brother Sisson. I'd say, hey, Dave, this is my friend. He doesn't know the Lord. Can you talk to him? Now, my friend was already down there. He had no option. Okay, that was my evangelism plan. By the way, beat knocking on doors, right? I mean, they were just right there, shooting fish in a barrel. Then we, not knocking on doors was great. I was kidding on that. But, but listen, I, I, I immediately thought, I want my friends to get saved. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I want to, and then I wanted to get involved in soul winning. And, and uh, the, the, the assistant pastor took me out once. And mostly on their Thursday nights was mostly uh, following up on people who had visited church. And so there were some Navy guys there. And it's like, let's go soul winning. We just go soul winning at some off the off time, 
But that's when you, when you really follow Jesus, you have a supreme love for him, but you cannot. If that supreme love for Christ does not transfer into a love for others, I'm sorry, you're missing it. You're missing it. If you can be here, and I'm, I'm meddling now. If you can be here on Tuesday night for summer saturation and you aren't, there's something wrong with that. I'll just be wrong. You're Thursday night. You're not Sunday morning. And I guess I'll really throw this out since I'll get darts anyhow. If you're, a, if you're in a ministry in this church, you ought to be here on, on, on soul winning. Let's be honest with you. I don't think that's in our constitution. I don't think that's in the worker's covenant, but come September it probably will be. We need to be, now I understand you may work or something, but listen, I understand we love our Sunday school classes, we love to sit up here and sing about God, but man, that love's got to get to people. It's, it's got to be taken to them. They ain't come, we've already, look, if you've been a Christian for a while, all your friends, you already, you've, already, you've already got all them. Your family, you've already been all over it, right? And, and you, you meet people at work and stuff, and you probably have got that, 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 that fish take a little bit sorted out. Hey, there's a lot of other fish out there, but let's just go get them. Okay? I mean, you know, you, you ever go fishing? I, I go with Brother Ross, we usually don't catch anything. But we'll go up there and we'll go to five or six different spots during the day because we're trying to find the spot that's hot. The fish aren't coming to us. we got to go get them. And so if we love Christ, we will, we will love him supremely. We don't care about earthly loss, but we'll also love others supremely. And let's end right there. Let's pray.